Welcome to Design TV by Sandow. I'm Avi Rajagopal, Editor-in-Chief of Metropolis. You know, one of the things that we really learned in 2020 is the value of the outdoors. We're all more eager than ever before to go outside, obviously, because there are just so many health and wellness benefits of an indoor-outdoor lifestyle. And we've seen architects and designers take full advantage of it in recent years, even before 2020. However, um, the American Institute of Architects, the AIA's um, home design trend survey from quarter one of 2021. So their most recent trend survey puts outdoor kitchens at the very top of home design trends with um, half of all architects saying that the number of clients who are asking for some kind of outdoor cooking, dining, food experience has been growing. Um, and luckily we have a design breakthrough that's now made it more possible than ever before to give those clients what they want and more. Uh, we're here to talk about the Caesar Stone Outdoor Collection, which is the first ever collection of quartz surfaces created for the outdoors. And here to talk with me about it are Elizabeth Markles, who is Caesar Stone's VP of Marketing, and Ida Weiner, who, is, um, who manages the R&D materials team at Caesar Stone. Liz and Ido, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having us. So Liz, why don't you introduce us to the outdoor collection? Tell us how this collection was developed, what colors are available, so just what does the collection look like? Sure, I'd love to. Well, I think, you know, and I'm glad that I'm here with Ido because he has even more history on this um, than I do. I just get to reap the benefits of all his hard work. But quite generally, you know, I think that we saw this trend coming our way uh, a number of years ago. And that's part of really some of the magic that we like to repeat at Caesar Stone in that we bring forward to people things that they didn't even know that they needed yet. And then by the time that, you know, when we get it to market, you know, we're, we're perfectly timed. And I think this was a, a really great example of that um, pandemic notwithstanding. What we had seen over the last number of years is that, uh, you know, regardless, people were really looking to improve their outdoor space, um, to make it a more livable space and to also be more creative in their outdoor spaces. So whether it was um, you know, a renewed interest in growing your own vegetables or your own fruit, you know, rooftop gardens have just exploded, whether you're in an urban setting or you, know, you have more uh, property you know, in, a, in an urban city or in uh, the suburbs. And so we really wanted to tap into that. Now, Caesar Stone has um, unbelievable quality. I mean, we, we offer a lifetime warranty because we know that it's going to you know, outlive anybody that chooses it. But that being said, it did have some limitations with regard to being outside. And so Ido and his team really you know, went back to square one to figure out what we could do to ensure that we were able to promise um, the same attributes that we do across all Caesar Stone, which is innovation in color, innovation in finish, uh, innovation in usage, and came up with three really beautiful, soft colors uh, as a launch to our product. So we have three colors. One is called Palm Shade, which is um, a white color with a little bit of a vein. And that really allows people to continue the inside out feeling because we know that the white and the veined colors are really the most popular at Caesar Stone. So if someone has that in their kitchen, they can really extend the aesthetic of their home to the outside. We also launched uh, Midday, which is more of, a, um, of a, a white kind of cement look that is almost exactly like our indoor cement look. So again, we were very conscious of um, you know, tapping into our most popular color so that people could extend the aesthetic of their inside to the outside. Um, and then we have uh, Clear Skies, which is more of a, a gray color. Uh, just again, you know, neutral grays are super popular. We've seen them grow over the last number of years. That popularity is not going anywhere. So that is what the palette is for now. We're always innovating, as you know, and we're looking at different finishes and different colors for the future. I think that especially that idea of like forming those connections between inside and outside is just so vital. Um, you know, I think it really supports the reason why people are really gravitating to these outdoor spaces, which is to, you know, take their life outdoors, um, you know, which mm -hmm. is to kind of um, create that seamless experience um, between um, a kitchen indoors and then their outdoor space. And of course, um, you know, before we get further into that, um, tell us a little bit about what makes this 
collection, you know, from a performance point of view or an attributes point of view, especially suitable for outdoor use. Um, and you know, what did you have to do to kind of get to that point? How do you how do you ensure that this collection performs to you know those Caesar Stone standards that Liz talked about um, when it's installed outdoors? Well, actually, it was a pretty interesting process because being first to the market has a lot of advantages. So first of all, we, we decided that it needs to be as good as and better than the regular performance. So we can't compromise on the regular performance on product our product have in regards to strength, in regards to staining resistance, in regards to the, all the regular things that our customers are you know, used to, to getting in indoor. And then we started thinking what outdoor challenges are we facing? So obviously, the main challenge is UV resistance because the regular quartz technology um, is, is, not, is not fantastic in that. And we had to basically reinvent the technology. We had to develop our own new technology that, that is unique and is uh, only ours. Um, and it took quite a while, actually. We started from very, you know, from a vial in a lab up to tons of, of material. Um, and made a lot of tests in the lab and in certified locations that test UV resistance. So that was one challenge. Um, another challenge was obviously the, the other conditions, outdoor humidity, temperature. Uh, we are a global company, so you need this, this product to be uh, to withstand conditions in Australia, in Florida, in Texas, in Alberta. And so, in, yeah, yeah. And, and in Canada and in, in the northeast of the United States. So yeah, Exactly. Yeah. So we went down to minus, minus uh, 30s, and I'm happy to say it, was, it performed extremely well. Um, we added all sorts of, of staining materials that you might uh, meet outdoors, okay, both in regards to, you know, special things that get this, might get the surface dirty, and things that are more frequently used in barbecues and, and, and these type of conditions. Um, and really we tried to, to ruin it as, as best as we could um, unsuccessfully. So that was good news. Yeah. Oh my God, barbecue sauce on the kitchen counter. Absolutely. I can't even, yeah. oh my God, that yeah. is just crazy. But of course, you know, that's the thing, that's the insight, right? It's, right. you know, what kinds of things do people want to do outdoors and how do you support that? Mm -hmm. um, that's just fantastic. Uh, tell us a little bit, you know, I, I started off talking about outdoor kitchens, but of course, this is not a product that's only for kitchens. Right. Um, it can really go into a wide range of applications. Tell, a little mm -hmm. bit, tell us a little bit about, you know, how and where designers can use this collection. Sure. Well, I mean, I think one of the things that Ido really tested for was um, the heat resistance and the fire resistance. And because it has a much higher fire rating, uh, we know that outdoor fireplaces, fire pits, have become super um, you know, popular as well. So that's one of the applications that we're seeing increasing growth in. You can use it as a pool surround. Um, around a water feature if you wanted to. You know, we see it in vertical applications as well if you wanted to bring your countertop, you know, to have you know, a bit of a backsplash. So there's both vertical and horizontal. Um, you know, you could use it to uh, demark any kind of flower beds or, you know, in a really kind of architectural drawing uh, or garden. You know, you can really use it as the border. So there is really an infinite number of possibilities for the outdoor product. That's amazing because what you've done is really expanded the palette of materials that maybe even landscape architects might might be able to use, or you know that designers might be able to use in in gardens or you know in other places. Oh, that's just fantastic. Yeah, we've actually yeah we've had a lot of discussions with landscape architects who are really challenged with materiality. You know what can withstand multiple seasons exposure. Um, to the variance of temperatures that Ido referred to as well. I mean, there it, it's one thing to, um, you know, to test it in a stable environment as hot or as cold as it gets, but it's the variance in between and the back and forth that's really important. And we know from landscape architects that the challenge of materiality is really important for them. So anything that can withstand that is something that they're going to choose to use. Right. Um, you know, as you were developing this collection, you know, especially with the colors, of course, you spoke about the inside outside connection. Um, were there, you know, other insights that you brought into play as you were developing the collection, Edo? You know, Liz just spoke about landscape architects, talking to landscape architects, but, you know, what are some of the other things you were thinking about as you kind of brought this collection together, especially with these first three products? 
Look, Caesar Stone is always in a constant state of innovation. So whether it's for outdoor or new finishes indoor. And one of the first questions that we put to ourselves or you know, the, the first priority that we put to ourselves is that whatever we develop has to be on par with, with our best. We only launch our best. So certainly the quality is number one for us. Um, you know, the color is uh, a high priority as well. Uh, the, up, the uptake of a new color, obviously we have a lot of experience in trend forecasting and understanding what people would want. Um, and I think the other thing that we were looking at, you know, Edo really uh, stayed close to all the regions in our global network with regard to um, not just the temperatures, but the taste levels. So, you know, Australia likes a lot of, you know, lighter colors and concrete cement looking colors. There are a lot of places in North America that are really regional specific about what they like. So, for example, um, you know, in the in the Southwest, we're looking at, you know, should we introduce more of a terracotta kind of color? You know, that's sort of more in their landscape, because I think that what we see in outdoor applications is that not only do people want to extend their inside living space, but they really want it to read as part of a natural environment. So anything that relates to where they are geographically, I think is, is really compelling. So I think that we looked at that across the board and playing with, with colors. I mean, we always start out with a, with a bigger palette and then we refine it to what we know we can really perfect. And then, you know, in the next phases, we always go back to, okay, let's see what colors we left on the table and how we can perfect those. Is that um, to, yeah. yeah, I agree. And it's, it's also correct in regards to functionality because we had the discussion with the markets and trying to understand the different needs. You know, you have hot areas in Australia and hot area in the U areas in the US, but the requirements or the type of cleaning materials they use or the type of spices each area of the world uses uh, you know, we, we talked with the sales team and they told us, oh, we need you to check this and we need right. you to check that just to adjust it uh, uh, exactly to, to the local markets. It was we, the Marmite versus the Frank's Red Bull. Yeah, exactly. Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's incredible because, you know, it's just, it's not just a technical challenge, it's a cultural challenge, right? It is. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's great. And, and I think, you know, if we have more thoughtful, uh, products like this in the outdoors, I think we're going to see, uh, you know, there, there are serious sort of health and wellness benefits here mm -hmm. um, to be had. Um, and, you know, it's great that you're supporting that. Uh, you know, of course, as we as we're kind of inching our way out of this pandemic, hopefully, you know, a lot of our attention um, around the world really is around wellness, but also around, you know, sustainability. Um, you know, we're, we're more uh, focused than ever on being responsible in our material use. So, Tell our viewers a little bit about Caesar Stone's environmental commitments. Um, break down quartz as material actually for us too, um, a little bit in, from, sure. from the sustainability point of view. And then I'd love to hear, you know, how it applies to uh, Caesar Stone's collections. Right, do you want to take that or do you want me to? You start on Okay, I'll start. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, from a holistic perspective, I mean, one of the things that we obviously take a look at is, um, is how we produce uh, the product. So, you know, we're, we're um, the beneficiaries of the fact that we control our whole supply chain. So that means that we've got eyes from, you know, the moment that we have the raw material all the way to the finished slab, which is very important to us. We know who's touched the product, you know, along, along the way. So that's important. With regard to our manufacturing process, you know, it's a fairly closed loop system where we recycle um, I think it's more than 97% of yeah, the water that almost, we use. Almost 100% yeah. of the water are recycled. Yeah. Um, you know, we look at the materiality. Obviously, you know, as you know, safety has been a big, big issue for us. Uh, not just the safety of the people that are manufacturing our product, but our customers who are cutting the product. And as you know, that we launched Masters of Stone um, last year, which really talks to um, you know, environmental um, conditions within a fabricator shop, for example, we want to make sure that everybody along the supply chain, as I said, uh, remains safe, remains healthy, uh, and, you know, treats the product the way that they should so that the end use product is obviously, you know, 100% safe. So when someone does put it into their home, the other thing that we try to communicate to people is that there is an environmental component to a lifetime warranty. It's not a disposable product. And I think that in a lot of um, brands, and I'm not talking about countertops, you know, whether it's in design for sure, in fashion for sure, this element of disposability of, you know, got to get the next thing, uh, you know, that really leads to a lot of waste and a lot of environmental pressure. So, you know, it's it feels good to be able to stand behind a product that we know is going to outlive um, the customer. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think designers maybe understand enough how much a lifetime warranty is actually mm-hmm. a huge sustainability milestone, um, yeah. you know, in terms of durability. And then um, I think that idea of looking at, at, you know, health and safety and wellness, not just for the people who can use the end product, mm-hmm. but for the people who make it, the people that's who right. install it, you know, that's really important. And, um, you know, of course, um, OSHA last, I think it was 2018, released new guidelines around how, you know, solid surface uh, materials and quartz materials, sh- engineered stone basically should be handled. That's um, right. You know, and so that's really important. It's really important, I think, for designers using these materials to really select materials that have put thought into that as well, because, you know, your choices can make a difference um, in sort of the health and safety of people up and down the supply chain. Um, exactly. You know, and so picking products that make a difference there is, is so huge. So yeah. really, um, you know, hats off on that. Um, yeah, I mean, corporately, we just believe that, look, we're, we're in business, but for the grace of our customers. And so it's just as critical to ensure that they're as educated, they know as much as we do, that we're keeping everybody safe um, and everybody is doing the best as far as uh, best practices go. Right. I mean, and especially in an outdoor collection where the reason you're doing it is so that, you know, people can have, you know, people can be healthy, people can live a full and wonderful life. You want to make sure that everybody who touches, um, you know, the project from start to end, um, you know, feels those same benefits. That's that's really incredible. Um, one last technical question here. Um, you know, are there any considerations in terms of installing this product outdoors um, as opposed to installing um, quartz materials indoors? Is there anything designers should know about, you know, when they're detailing it or when they're, you know, getting it fabricated for spaces? So basically, uh, as I mentioned, the, you know, one of our main models in the development was as good as the, the quartz, it was not only in regards to the performance that the end customer sees, but also the fabricators, which are a very significant part of our value chain. Um, so we wanted to make sure that the advantage that quartz has for the fabricator, that it can work fast and, and cut easily, um, will remain similar in, in this type of product. And we made a lot of tests with fabricators and the, the, um, the responses we got were fantastic. And they love it. They can work uh, fast. They can uh, cut it very similarly the way they cut uh, the indoor product. Um, so that was, was something we were very happy uh, when we launched to, to tell the fabricators, look, you, you're already used to our product. You know how to work with it. Just work in a very similar way. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things we do, regardless of the product, is that we give all the tools to the fabricator as far as education, whether it's the adhesives that they use, the color matching for it, we, we provide all of that to them so that there, there's no guesswork for them involved. That's fantastic. I mean, you know, to have the first outdoor quartz collection and then to have all of these details kind of taken care of as well mm-hmm. um it's just fantastic you know it's just it's ready for adoption right it's it's here and it really supports a important very vitally important design movement um and so you know it's just it's such a pleasure to be able to talk through this um you know just um one last question so um for all our viewers on design tv who are listening to this um where can they go find out more um, how can they start using it in their projects? They can start using it in their projects as soon as they want to. I mean, it is available across the country, you know, across North America. They can go onto our website, obviously, uh, CaesarStoneUS.com. They can also go to um, their sales rep, obviously, if they're an architect or designer. You can get samples from Material Bank. Uh, consumers can get samples from our website. And of course, they can go into any of our showrooms. That's fantastic. Uh, what a great collection. And such a pleasure to be able to tell the story um, with Anito. Uh, you know, just what a great breakthrough, something that really supports, uh, you know, human well-being, um, a product that's really thoughtful across the supply chain um, and offers great value with that, you know, with the durability and the lifetime warranty. Thank you so much, both of you, for spending the time with me today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So very early on, I got very interested in uh, building different ways and to really change the living environment for us 
humans because you know a building actually in a way should be operating like we do. I'm interested in that balance between creativity and spontaneity and actually something that's more mapped out to to really unlock and find out you know the parameters of design and what that actually means throughout that design process. I'm Sarah Shelton, market editor at Lux Interiors and Design. I'm so proud to say that Lux is celebrating Black History Month, and we're recognizing and showcasing the work of Black artisans and makers that are inspiring us that I'm sure will also inspire you. Today, I am overjoyed to have Gracelyn Haynes with us. Just looking at Grace's paintings brings a sense of joy, and having her work featured on the pages of Lux's January-February issue, which is on newsstands right now, offers such a bright spot within the pages. Her colorful, beautiful, and bold figurative paintings will stop you in your tracks. And I cannot wait to dive into these canvases with the woman behind the brush. Uh, hi, Grace, welcome. Hello, yeah, thank you for having me. And thank you for that beautiful introduction. I'm really happy to be here and talk about my work and share a bit about my process. We couldn't be more excited to have you on today. And Grace, I know we've been corresponding over the course of a few months, but I've been looking forward to this conversation because I think that we are going to be able to dive into some things that we necessarily couldn't you know, get on the pages of the magazine. Um, but before we do that, Grace, I just thought it would be nice for you to just give a little introduction to the viewers, who you are, where you live, what you do, you know, just the basics. Yeah, well, hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Um, my name is Gracelyn Haynes. I'm originally from California, but recently moved to New Jersey for graduate school. Um, I'm a figurative painter, and I my primary focus in my work is Black women and womanhood and femininity. And I'm also very interested in themes such as color and fashion and the way we choose to adorn ourselves. Um, a lot of my work um, showcases one figure in it, and I only paint women as well. And I often like to explore themes in my work um, through the paint medium itself, such as textures, um, patterns, and how patterns can tell stories, how the pose of the figure can evoke certain emotions, and how we can explore what it means to be a woman in this century right now, where um, women are very empowered and have agency over their, their lives. Okay, perfect, because everything you touched on is what I would love to dive into, like the color, the women, the interior. So I, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, you're ready to, you're game for, for all of that. So I'm glad you brought up the, the obvious, like the women in the, in, who are the subject of your paintings. You can't, I mean, you look at your portfolio and it's these beautiful women lounging in these, in these really beautiful spaces. And I want to know, like, who, who are these women? You know, what's their narrative? I look at them and I just immediately want to know about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so the women are often inspired by women that I've met that are in my lives and also um, some of my own life experiences as well. Um, I'm really intrigued by this idea of safe space where women can find spaces where they can not have the weight of the world on their shoulders. Oftentimes black women were expected to be strong all the time, we're expected to carry a lot on our shoulders. So I'm really interested in the spaces where black women can just exist and not resist. And so exploring that theme in my work in terms of where, what are places that we can rest? What are places that we can just exist and be ourselves? And how do those spaces look like? How do we decorate those spaces? What are the colors in those spaces? What are the various poses that we do in those spaces? Uh, these are themes that I'm interested in my work in terms of what, who women are behind closed doors in, in our own environment. And oftentimes these women are young women um, because, because of the age that I am, I'm a young woman. So I, it's the experience that I relate to the most. Um, and oftentimes it's that period of um, growing into your womanhood and figuring out who you are when you're in your twenties and you're figuring out your way of um, dressing, you're figuring out how to decorate your first apartment that you own, you're also figuring out your identity as a woman. And so that's the stage I like to talk about in my work. That's fascinating. And I can't help but, but think how we're all spending so much time alone in our apartments or our homes now. And it almost like these women on the canvases, I, you know, maybe you kind of feel this kinship, you know, you're spending all this time at home and, 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 and so am I. And, um, 
but it is, I, I, I'm glad you brought up the, the interiors because, you know, we're an interior design brand and I couldn't help but, you know, see these spaces with wallpaper and floral textiles and plants and art on the walls and 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 same with the fashion element the dresses that these women are wearing I, I want to own these dresses you know I want to lounge about in, in in their wardrobe do you have a, a, an interest in those worlds a creative interest in like fashion and interiors I mean they come up just so strongly in in your work that I I just wanted to to ask that yeah um I love interior design and I also love fashion design. I do come from a um, commercial design background and I recently transferred to the fine art world. And um, I've always been interested in the way people decorate their apartments, their, their homes, their spaces, and specifically the way they choose to express their identity through aesthetics, whether it be the way that you wear your clothing or the way that you adorn your living room and the things that you hang up. And also how like colors say a lot about our personality in terms of what colors that we're drawn to um, and what that says about who we are as people. I'm curious, Grace, like what, it, what is your space look like? Is it full of color, like the, like the subjects that you paint? <laughs> yes, I, I'm actually moving into a new apartment this week and I bought a few of the, the decorations for it. And it's interesting because um, in, the, in my paintings, I use a lot of pastels and pinks, um, which, is, which is interesting because my apartment is actually decorated in more like warm colors, like yellows and browns and greens. And I think it's because I like to, um, I don't want to get tired of the colors I paint. <laughs> so I feel like if I'm living in them, I then go into my studio and paint them. I'm like, oh, it's like an overload. So I use um, a different color palette in my, um, in my own home space. But I do love to wear pinks and pastels colors. Like those are my favorite, favorite colors to wear. I saw on Instagram, I, I saw that you had like some really colorful fashion. So, but I was curious about, <laughs> curious about your apartment. Well, good luck with, with the move. Um, speaking of color, um, another obvious, you know, theme in your, in your work is this, is this just riot of beautiful color. And, and when we were corresponding a couple months ago, when we started working on the magazine page, you said something to me that, that really jumped out and I, and I saved it. And it's that you said that color, color is a spiritual experience. And I feel like I'm experiencing a color or a spiritual experience just looking at your work. And I was just wondering, you know, what your approach and relationship is to color. Like, how do you come up with these combos um, or more than just two, just like the, all of these, these colors on a canvas? Yes, I think um, color has always played a significant role in my art making. Um, I believe in color, not just as an adjective, but as a verb, like a form of action, something that makes a statement. And I believe that you can tell a story in itself just through colors. Like you look at Mark Rothko and how he used color, color blocks to do his oil paintings to, to tell a story, to create an emotion. And so I'm really inspired by this idea of color being used as a form of action. I believe that color is a very spiritual experience in terms of the colors that we're drawn to naturally and how they say a lot about our psychology. And I think it, um, in terms of color, there's also like a color test. If you Google color test online, and there's this test where you pick certain colors and they can show where you are at in life based off the colors that you choose. And it's like eerily accurate. And so I do think that colors really are related to our psychology and also interested in the ideas of how colors shape womanhood. Oftentimes pinks and uh, pastel colors are associated with femininity and darker colors are associated with masculinity. So I'm really intrigued by kind of playing on these societal stereotypes in terms of what color and gender are related to and showing that in my work. Okay, well, I know what I'm doing after this. I'm gonna Google the color test <laughs> take it, and I'm gonna send it to all my friends. That sounds really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of tying into color, because I remember we talked about this, um, you know, I know it's important in your work that you're, that you, you're addressing complex topics of stereotypes surrounding black femininity. And, and in that, there's also this relationship of light and dark and how they're associated with certain things. Um, can you expand on that a, a bit for us, you know, going back to the, you know, the complex topics that you're, you're addressing and, and how that ties in with, with the, you know, the colors and, and the black that is on the canvas? Yes, um, I think 
in regards to like to color um, a lot of times we see darker colors specifically the color black as either associated with evil or darkness or things that are sinister and so I'm really inspired to to challenge these tropes in my work in terms of how we associate the color black and how the our perception of the color black specifically flat matte um, pure black um, how that perception changed when it's surrounded by other colors as well. Um, so I really want to challenge the notion in my work where both dark and light colors exist in an image, but the dark color is not associated with anything evil. It's actually the main central focus of the painting, but it's not evil in comparison to the light. Right. That no, that, that makes sense. It's so interesting that that's something we may not have been aware of, you know, consciously when we when we see color represented in art but yeah. definitely here I that's a, I think a really important takeaway um it looks like you're in your studio now correct or in a, an office yeah, yeah I'm in my uh my art studio art studio at my graduate program <laughs> where are you starting the graduate program um I just started at Rutgers University last fall and with my master's specifically my master's in visual arts Oh, congratulations. Best of mm -hmm. luck, you know, th going through all of that. I'm sure that's, you know, a really cool experience. Mm -hmm. um, now that we're, we're in your, your creative space, I'm just wondering like what it looks like. I mean, I'm kind of, I'm so intrigued by the thought of um, an artist creating mm -hmm. in their space. What does that look like for you? Are you, you know, blaring music? Is it quiet? Or is there a candle burning? Are you up late at night, early in the morning? Um, just curious kind of what that looks like for you. Yeah, so I'm a night owl. My creativity often comes at night because I feel like it's quiet and the world is falling asleep. And I feel like that's when my creativity comes alive. But lately I've been I'm waking up early because I feel like um, it's also inspiring to be up before the world is up. So I'm really like my creative creativity comes around when kind of like the world is at sleep. Um, but in regards to my studio, I think um, oftentimes I, um, I have lots of books in my studio. I do love since they they like bring out that creativity like being able to activate your physical senses so sometimes I put on incense or I may burn sage um, a lot of my work is plastered over the wall um, I have my printer as well and I also often have like um, a mood board in terms of images that inspire me whether they're from magazine cutouts or from other artists and I like to plaster that around as well. I often have different collectibles like I like to collect um, Essence magazines and Jet magazines and I like to hang that over my work as well because those magazines are about Black womanhood as well. And so it's really just a space where I feel like everything everything that inspires me creatively exists, whether it's books, it's magazines, um, it's other artwork that I've collected. Um, and oftentimes it's a little messy, not too messy. I like to call it an organized clutter. Um, I like it to look worked in, um, but I don't like it to be too messy to the point where it's like I don't know where things are but overall I would say it's just like a creative haven for me a creative space where everything that relates to my practice can exist. Wow well I would love to get a studio tour you know when it when it's safe to be out and about it sounds like a really cool space to to work in you know I'm just so curious someone who's so creative what you're doing to stay inspired and creative. Yeah, so it has been a little bit of a challenge with COVID. I would say when COVID first started, I felt like, oh, I don't know what to do. I feel kind of stuck. But as um, the pandemic continued on, I was like, okay, I can't stay stuck. I have to find new ways to stay creative. And so I do think that now that things are opening up, I have been going back to galleries and museums again, just to, to remind myself of, of what the where the work goes once it's out of the studio. Because sometimes you get kind of um, yeah. caught up in your studio you forget that it goes out into the world daily walks definitely keep me sane and also make sure that I'm engaging with people intentionally whether it be through zoom or catching up with my friends and um, talking about art and having discussions also reading books have definitely kept me sane and inspired um, and I would say watching artist talks there's so many Instagram lives now that are going on that you can kind of catch in or so many artists talking about their work online that brings me to a question I was excited to ask like what what's next yes um, so I'm very excited especially now that I'm in graduate school I'll be doing the Armory Art Fair in New York City hopefully it'll be in person I'm um, a two-person show with my gallery Loose Gallery in Italy um, and so I'm very excited. So I'm prepping for that as well. And I'm doing a new series where it explores multiple figures and one, one painting. And I'm also focusing specifically on young Black teenage girls in my work and ideas around dance. 
And so I'm really excited to explore um, this new series of work where I'm painting multiple figures in one painting and exploring the relationships with these figures with one another and how I can portray the, the figures um, to make them look even younger than the way they look now and also exploring fashion and the relationship with dance and also spaces where young black girls come together to simply exist and be and not resist. Oh, that's incredible. Well, we can't wait to see all of those things come to the surface. And I can't wait to see also how you work multiple figures onto a canvas. I think that's gonna be really exciting you know, to watch that trajectory. And I'm sure it will be a beautiful accomplishment. Well, Grace, this has been so lovely to catch up with you and just get a, a peek inside of your really beautiful and creative world. We cannot wait to see what's next. And I suggest all of you follow along on Grace's Instagram, you know, so we can keep tabs on, on, on these amazing exhibits and projects that you have in the works. And until then, Grace, this was really fun. Thank you so much.